everyone, it is Sky, and I was just, well, asked, or I just finally saw, uh, a video by Joy Hugh on discussing the topic of training with our guide dogs at specific schools that we went to as guide dog handlers, and I thought it would be really cool to do one of those. And um, we haven't done a video in a long time, I have so much footage from different things, and I might put some of that random footage in this video while I'm talking, because you don't just have to see my face the whole time. But we're going to discuss all of how training worked and what it was like for me and Cindy. So I am going to use my phone and the magnification software on here to read it. I think it's kind of cool how we're all describing the different ways <laughs> for reading these questions. A lot of people are using Braille notes. Uh, I don't know a lot of Braille. I'm bad at it and that's bad. I need to learn more, but I can see text as long as it's really close to my face because I do have a little bit of vision, uh, about an inch or two of detailed vision as long as I have magnification. So that's how I'm going to read these questions. What is the name of the guide dog school you attended? I went to Guide Dogs of the Desert, which is a very small school. Not a lot of people know about it, but I kind of like that about it and I'm going to get into that more as these questions go on. But yes, Guide Dogs of the Desert. Where is the school located? It is located in Palm Springs, California. Well, technically I think it's located in like Whitewater, which is like a tiny little area like right outside Palm Springs, but like it takes 10 minutes to drive into the city. So we do most of our routes inside of Palm Springs and surrounding areas, but it was like technically located right outside of Palm Springs. Briefly describe your application process from start to finish. Include dates if possible. Okay. Um, so I started applying right when my pet dog died. He was a Bichon Frise and he died um, beginning of March. And I know I'm a crazy person, but I decided to apply for my guide dog about two weeks after that because I'm one of those people who just loves having an animal with them. And I was going into high, or sorry, I was going into university and uh, knew that the independence a guide dog would bring would just be invaluable to me. So I applied at the very end of March, probably like around the 21st, 22nd, and I remember getting. I, I did the online application, which was right on their website. There's a huge application uh, that has lots of questions and things to fill out and stuff like that. Uh, so I did that and then they, I think the same day, they emailed me and said that they got my application and they were reviewing it. And then the next day, they actually sent me all of the forms and stuff they have to sign. So see we had to do vision checks so I'm um, saying how much I can see and getting an eye doctor to sign it we had to do character references we had to do doctors visits and stuff like that so, like we had to sign a bunch of forms um, you know giving consent for media releases and stuff like that uh, anyway we had to do all of this stuff and then I got at them in, in, in about a week I think it took a while for some of the appointments to be made and stuff but yeah about a week and between that time, they also asked for a video of you traveling and walking. And then, so I took that and that was just with a cane, you have someone follow you and take a video. And so they can see your walking speed and the area you live in and stuff like that. And then Guide Dogs of the Desert, because they're so small, unless you live really close, um, and I live about four or five hours away from them, then you have to do a a video interview instead of a home interview. So I know there were a few people who lived like two hours away that they did home interviews for, but for me, they did a video interview, which was they give you a, a big list of questions, I think there's like 20 of them, and you go and reply to all of those questions in a video. So they were questions like, where do you live? What are some of the challenges that you face every day? Uh, what are some of the routes you take? How will a guide dog help you? Uh, what is the most important uh, aspects that a guide dog could provide to you that would be good for your lifestyle, where do you work, what kind of breed of dog do you want, everything like that. So pretty much everything that most people get in a home interview, uh, you would have on this video. So it is your responsibility to send in both the video of you walking and crossing streets and things like that and the interview video. So those were both part of my application and again I got everything sent in in about I think a week to a week and a half and bless her Jennifer who is the contact I think for students and applications at Guide Dogs with the Desert she 
was amazing. She kept me updated every step of the way. She kept sending me emails saying, you're here, we've received this, we need this. And she would tell me that my application was being reviewed and stuff like that. She was amazing. So because they're a small school, I think they really respect that I got things in fast and they knew I was really serious and I wasn't just one of those people who was willing to wait months and months. I, <laughs> I, you know, I got everything in really fast and they saw that and I think that is part of the reason why they were keeping me so well updated and got back to me so quickly. But Jennifer told me that they had board meetings every three months I believe it is and in these board meetings they would look at the applications that they received every three months and go through them and accept and not accept or you know discuss dogs or matches and stuff like that so she warned me that when I was getting my application in they were just about to have a board meeting and that's why I got everything in so fast well partially because she was kind enough to tell me about that I was able to get things in really fast and because of that, the board meeting was at the very beginning of April, and I got my acceptance and class date together April 4th, I believe. So, I mean, I applied March 30th and got my class date April 4th. And my class date was in six months on September 25 to October 22, I think. So. That was super exciting for me. I flipped out. I remember everything I was doing when I got the email on my phone and was accepted and got my class day. I was, <laughs> I was a very happy, happy person. I was currently studying for my um, entrance exams for university, and I like couldn't study for the rest of the day. I was so excited. So, um, yeah, that was a long six months to wait, but. Because Guide Dogs of the Desert is so small and they do custom matches for you, the six month wait was actually very short for them, especially for a poodle. Poodles are very custom uh, and it can take a long time to get the right match and they're in very high demand. So because of that, I was really lucky to get such a quick class date. Normally, uh, it can take a year if you're open to any breed and if you're not and you're more specific and you want like for example a poodle or a german shepherd then it can take anywhere from two to four years so that's just because of the small school and the more you ask for the more specific you are the harder it will be to match you but yeah generally my story shows you that you can also be matched very fast it just depends on if they can find you a good match you know how well the application process goes all of that fun stuff. So yeah, that was my application and class date. Number four, how many people are in a typical class at this school and how many classes graduate each year? So Guide Dogs of the Desert is very small. We have, I believe, 40 people graduating each year. Uh, that's probably being a little gracious. <laughs> Say, how are you doing? So he's like, you have to look at me. So that means that our class size is typically five to six students. Uh, it's very small. And we usually have four to five classes a year in the actual in-class training, so at the actual facility in Palm Springs. However, Guide Dogs of the Desert also does in-home training as well. So some of those applicants will be trained in home, wherever they are in their community. Those go into the number as well. But yes, typically there's about 40 uh, guide dogs placed each year. Number five, what dog breeds are used by the school? So, uh, as most people probably know by now, Guide Dogs of the Desert is very, very well known for their poodles. They release, uh, at least last time I was in class, which was about a year ago, um, they are the number one producer of standard poodles as guide dogs in the world. And that's saying something because they're so small. <laughs> I think they get out about 20-ish poodles uh, a year. Um, roughly, maybe a little less, maybe like 18 or something like that, but yeah, they get a, about that many poodles. Uh, this is because they have been working very, very hard on their breeding program to make sure that they breed poodles uh, properly, they have the right health and temperament and everything, and it, it did take them about 10 years to really master it, and they said only in about the last three years have they been really, really happy uh, with their poodles and their genetics and their breeding program with the poodles. So. Because it takes so long, uh, it is hard for uh, 
a lot of schools to get poodles into their training program. Also, poodles need to be trained differently than more of the traditional breeds like Goldens and Labradors. Because of all this, God Dogs of the Desert is very well known for their poodles. They breed standard poodles. Standard poodles are the big poodles. Uh, usually when I say poodles, people think of like little miniature poodles. But no, they breed standards, which I believe are 15 to 24 inches, but uh, Guide Dogs of the Desert sometimes has a bit bigger poodles, which can range from about 22 to 28 inches is typical for their program. And they have blue poodles, which are almost a black with a little bit of silver in them. Uh, they have black poodles, they have silver poodles, and they have brown poodles and white poodles, I think. I don't know, I can't see colors, so I'm just trying to remember. Other than the poodles though, they have German Shepherds, and these Shepherds originated from the Czech Republic, so their lines uh, are not American Shepherds, so they look different than your typical American bred German Shepherd that you see sometimes, which have more of the slanted backs and the saddle markings, and uh, they're a little bit lighter. The German Shepherds that they breed are, I believe, more auburn and black, and um, I'd say they actually have bigger ears and kind of skinnier tails, and they are, in general, a more skinnier dog. <laughs> Santee. So that is interesting about their shepherds. I mean, I would love a shepherd if I wasn't allergic, but geez, those things are high, high, high drive dogs. I mean, you don't give a shepherd to someone who's staying home half their week. Those dogs need hours of work a day. <laughs> yeah, but other than shepherds, they have Labrador Retrievers. They do black and yellow labs, and I am mostly black, but they've just got some more yellow labs into their breeding program, so that'll be good. And then they also do Golden Retrievers, yay! They Apparently they didn't have a lot of Golden Retrievers recently, but they again just bought a few dogs to get into their breeding program, and they're just getting their first uh, litters of Golden Retrievers almost through the puppy raising stage, so that'll be fun that they're going to have a few more Goldens in their program. But yes, the, those are the four breeds that they raise. Cindy, <laughs> what are you doing, Cindy? What are you doing? Sorry about my dog, guys. For those of you who can't see, she's stretched out in front of me, and I think the camera, I can't see what the camera's filming, but you probably just see her head, so. Okay, next question. What does your training look like? Include details about duration and structure. Okay, so a typical day of training for us was just like the other schools I've heard of, we got up very early. I think breakfast was typically at seven in the morning, but we had to have taken our dogs out at 6.30 in the morning, and we also had to feed them before we went to breakfast. So uh, a typical day for me was getting up at 5.45, and then, you know, getting ready to get a quick shower, blah, blah, blah. I think I actually took Cindy out at 6.15. Uh, sorry, this was a while ago, but yeah, I think I took her at 6.15. We took them out for about 10 minutes in the morning for their bathroom break, and then we came back in, and I think I fed her at about 6.30. Uh, and then that was another 10 minutes, and then I would go out and, uh, well, first I'd do anything else I needed to to get ready, and then I would go into the uh, common room and sit with my fellow students for the last few minutes and chat with them. Sometimes we'd head over a little early to breakfast and chat with the chef there, or we would find an instructor that came in early and chat with them, and <laughs> we'd always just find anyone lounging around and talk. So. Uh, because the school was so small, it was very much like that kind of family dynamic kind of thing, like very close-knit. Uh, there weren't a lot of people around, so you got to know everyone, and uh, it was pretty comfortable. We did that and went to breakfast at 7. I believe class started at 8, so typically we eat breakfast, we come back at about 7.30ish, and then what I do is I would groom Cindy which takes, if I do it every day, it takes about 15 minutes just to do the regular grooming and everything, brushing your teeth, uh, combing your ears, stuff like that. And then we would all meet in the common room at eight with our instructors. Usually they would tell us what we were going to do for the day. Then we'd go out around 8.30 and do obedience. Sometimes we'd all do it together. Sometimes we'd do it one at a time. Sometimes we'd do it in groups of three. But yeah, we do obedience. And obedience was always fun because the instructors would get more and more into it as the time went on and they thought it was so much fun like uh for instance at the beginning it was just you know basic obedience basic commands but as time went on it was you know throwing tennis balls everywhere and having them bounce around or trying to offer the dog bacon or getting really really excited and trying to uh, play with the dog while we were doing obedience so that was always an adventure <laughs> we had a lot of fun with it and i think our instructors their evil sides came out in obedience, but yes, it was a lot of fun. So, uh, after obedience, normally about nine, 
we would board the bus and do an outing. And, you know, we didn't have structured outings kind of like some schools do in that um, it was more um, oriented to each class. So at the beginning of this of the training, we would go and do easy routes kind of in the city. We might do a route a few times. At the beginning, you know, the instructors would hold the leash and as we went on, they would just walk with us and then we might do the route in pairs and then we might do the route solo at the more end of it. So yeah, we did that kind of stuff and uh, we'd always be back by 12. So we don't like my feet. We'd always be back by 12, which is when we would have lunch. And then after that, we would have a little break from like 12.30 to 1. And then we'd regroup at 1 in the same sitting room, home or whatever. And then we would either have a lecture or we would go and do another route or we would do a route and then we'd come back and have a lecture. So things would just change from day to day depending what we were doing. Yeah, just it really depended on uh, what was, you know, scheduled for the day and how things were going to play out and we'd kind of do it by ear and our instructors would kind of ask us, you know, what do you want to do, where do you want to go, what's important to you and uh, we would just go by what they said. So yeah, that was uh, the training, you know, some people I, I understand like it more structured, but I, I like that we could make suggestions and uh, if we were really excited about a route, they might do it a little faster and stuff like that. So yeah, that was the typical day of training. And then in the evenings, we would usually end training at 4.30 or so and then eat at 5. And <laughs> we parked the dogs regularly throughout the day, by the way, usually before lunch and before supper and before an outing. But yeah, we'd, came, we'd come back, have supper at 5, and then usually you'd want to be in bed by about 7.38 because <laughs> you want to get decent sleep because they work you hard at these schools. So. Yeah, that's, uh, that was training for us. Number seven, describe a typical day at the guide dog school. Um, I'm sorry, I kind of did that with six. Six and seven, I kind of intertangled a little bit, and I'm sorry about that. So what I'll say about this is I'll go a little bit more into the dynamic of the class because it was so small, as I kind of mentioned earlier, that it was very family -feely. So there weren't any cliques or like groups of people. Uh, I was the youngest by far in my class because I am 21 and because of that um, everyone else was older. I mean the oldest person I think was like 79 and then there were a few people in their 40s and then there was me who was 21 but we all really got together really well. We typically sit and chat and you know get excited about different things that were going on and uh, we all got to know each other and that was really nice and then we also got to know our instructors really well a lot of the time like even when we had breaks and stuff we wouldn't just go back and barricade ourselves in our rooms we would just sit in the sitting room and talk to each other there was always snacks out at the table so we'd always you know eat maybe we might have a little snack or there was a fridge that we could go and store stuff in someone at the school would go every beginning of the week and would ask us if we wanted to buy anything and then they'd go to the store and get it for us it was just it was really nice you know we just sat and chatted um i will say that at the end of every week uh something i really liked is that the instructors would take us each individually into another room privately and they would ask us how is this week going how are you getting along with your classmates how are you and your dog doing do you have any concerns do you have anything you'd like to do the next week and it was very individual and they just sit down and they'd be honest and they'd talk with you and they'd ask, you know, what was hard? What, what did you like? You know, how are you doing? Are you okay? And uh, this was really, really special for me because it really did show that your instructors were very individualized in their training and they cared about each, uh, each student. So that was really nice and I really liked that about the class. So now number eight. In three words, describe your first meeting with your dog. In three words. Oh boy. Oh, Joy, you know this is going to be hard for me. <laughs> I'd like to, like, I'm so chatty, I just want to talk about the whole experience, but, uh, let's see. Nerve-wracking, life-changing, and emotional. <laughs> uh, it was, it was amazing, and you know, you're just so overjoyed with everything, and, and um, I almost cried when <laughs> it was a close thing, but uh, man, that was incredible. Number nine. What reinforcers are used, both positive and negative? In other words, how are the dogs rewarded and corrected? So, 
Dive Dogs in the Desert is, as some might call it, an old school kind of training program. Uh, we use a lot of correction-based methods, and we also use a lot of positive enforcement uh, methods, but we only do it through praise. So we don't use any food at our school ever. There's never any positive re reinforcement for treat training or food or kibble or anything like that. Santini, what are you doing? Are you just stretching out? Are you just having a good time? Yeah. So um, a cool thing we did when class started was when we were doing Juno training, and for those who don't know, Juno is um, taking a harness and then you hold on to the harness while the instructors pretend they're the dog and they pull you around or else they get like a stuffed animal and do obedience with the stuffed animal and move the stuffed animal around but you're still feeling through the leash and collar what's happening. So during Juno training, one of the main focuses in our class was learning how to correct the dog properly. And what they would do is they would lead you around with this harness and the leash and everything and they would purposefully make the harness feel like it was doing something wrong, just like a dog would be distracted and pulled the way it wasn't supposed to or sniff the ground or something like that. And if we missed it, they'd say, correct, you know, correct your dog, correction. And they, of course, taught us how to correct properly before now, but they were very, very careful about showing us, you don't give a little wimpy correction. When your dog does something wrong and they know that they're not supposed to do it, it's a hard correction, <laughs> and it's not going to hurt the dog. Corrections never hurt the dog. What they're meant to do is tell them, one, you did it wrong, and two, to snap their brain out of whatever stupid thing they're doing. So when we corrected the dogs, you know, in training, in Juno training, that gave us a lot of confidence in knowing exactly how to correct properly. And so that was the main focus of when we were first starting out as students. So now I know how to correct a dog. <laughs> Sorry, I think Cindy sniffing the camera. That's a lot of what we did in the very beginning. And so yes, our school does focus a lot on correction-based training. My school believes that the dogs know the rules. By the time that they are placed with us, they are professionals. They know how to behave themselves. And when they do something wrong, it's because usually, I mean, we have to be, you know, smart as owners and, and handlers, and we have to be able to read our dogs and know why they're doing it. But usually, if they're doing something wrong, it's because they're trying to test and see if they can get away with it. And my school doesn't put up with that. They say, uh-uh, <laughs> that's not happening. So we correct. And we do that with both chain collars and with prong collars. Some people get a little iffy about the prong collars, but my school explained to me, and I think I explained in another video, so I'll keep this quick. Uh, the prong collars do not hurt the dogs. The prong collars do not go into their skin. They do not cut or anything like that. They're not painful but they do feel like a mom and dog has given them a good little nip. And that's exactly how dogs naturally communicate with each other. Even though me and Cindy don't use the prong much anymore, we still do use it when we're going to places where I know there's gonna be high distractions because a small correction with the prong collar, I don't even have to pull hard at all. Um, it's going to get Cindy's attention back on me very, very fast. Whereas the chain collar, you might really have to tug the dog. And a prong collar will never choke your dog, but a chain collar can. So you really have to know how to use both correctly. But there are advantages to prong collars and they can be really amazing tools if used properly. So yeah, that's how we correct our dogs. Of course, we also use verbal corrections to, you know, just a quick ah, ah. That is going to make your dog know they've done something wrong, and the longer you are with your dog, uh, the more verbal corrections needs, the less physical, but my school is heavy on physical corrections. Uh, apart from that, when it comes to praise, we, as I said, use a lot of padding and good girls, and you do such a good job, and good job with that, and um, they are perfectly fine with that kind of praise. Our dogs work for just, you know, a good girl. That's the beauty of dogs. They don't need treats or bribes or, and I know treats aren't bribes. I know treats are just positive reinforcements and I'm not trying to um, downplay any school who uses treats. I think that's fine, but our dogs work fine just, <laughs> our dogs work fine just, you know, by getting a good girl and, and um, just getting some physical love and that's all they need. So uh, a lot of people ask, how do I target with her when when she doesn't have any food? And all I do is <laughs> show her the target, you know, repeat it a few times, tap on it, and then tell her she's a good girl and repeat the name. And she gets it within 30 seconds. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much how we tell our dogs they're good. And then she also 
Cindy also gets to play her favorite game usually when we get home from a long work day or school day or whatever. We will go into the backyard and she gets to play fetch and tug and get all of that energy out and it's kind of like a reward for being such a good girl throughout the day. So that is how my school goes about correction and um, praise and positive reinforcement. What was the easiest part of training? The easiest part um, honestly was probably getting along with everyone. <laughs> I, I thought, maybe I'm saying that because I thought it would be difficult and um, you know, especially being the youngest person in class. Other than one of my trainers was actually, I think just as old, if not a little younger than me, which is crazy. She's an apprentice uh, trainer who's almost done her apprenticeship, but just the community, I thought it would be very difficult to get along with everyone in class. And I was really mistaken. I loved uh, that we all knew each other so well and we were so comfortable with each other in such a short amount of time. And that really made the training special. And it was just, you know, really nice. And you felt like you were at home. <laughs> so. So that is what I liked about it um, and what was at least easiest to me in terms of what I thought would not be easy. What was the most difficult part of training? <sighs> like Joy, um, I didn't find a lot too, too difficult. I got a little homesick, but not as much as I thought I would. Okay, here's, here's what was the most difficult for me. I got it. I know it. So in the class, we all had tons of questions when we first came in to train. And the majority of these questions were covered in later lectures in class. And so a lot of us would, at the beginning of the class or beginning of uh, when we first got our dogs, we'd ask so many questions. And our instructors would just say, be patient, we'll cover it, we promise. So because of that, it was really, really um, hard to wait to have all the topics covered. We just wanted to ask everything and get it all answered now. <laughs> and our instructor's like, uh-uh, we're gonna have a whole lecture on that and you just be patient and bond with your dogs. So uh, that was that was a little difficult, but in the end, everything was answered. And then we had time at the very end of training, a uh, whole entire time just set aside to ask any questions we could think of uh, at the end. But yeah, that waiting to get more and more information was a little difficult. <laughs> So, number 12, the last question. What was your favorite or most memorable moment of training? <laughs> my instructor was so mean. Uh, Mr. Noah, my one of my wonderful uh, apprentice instructors, decided that, so we had a bus that we traveled on when we went on our outings. And the bus had speakers, of course, and apparently they had somehow acquired a CD with just songs about dogs on it. And a lot of the times they just play like audiobooks for us while we were driving and stuff like that. But one particular day we were on a long drive, I think down to LA for training. And Mr. Noah decided it would be hilarious to play the whole city. And um, one of the songs that came on was How Much Was That Doggy in the Window? And one of the students made the mistake of going like, oh no, not this song. So our instructor turned the song up and replayed it about eight times in a row. I'm not kidding. Oh my gosh, that was the worst drive ever. I cannot listen to how much is that doggy in the window uh, ever again. It was horrible. It was such a bad experience. <laughs> so yeah, that was, that was not fun. Um, other than that, I mean, I had a lot of fun on the trip to LA actually, taking the trains and all being together and traveling. My instructor was working actually with a dog while we were there and her and me just went by ourselves and went through the city because I live in such a crowded area. And she had this big German Shepherd and I had my big poodle and we were just racing through. It was like on the outskirts of LA, I can't remember which town exactly, but we were racing through it with our huge dogs just having a good old time. The dogs were like racing. And it was a lot of fun. So I I just remember that trip to LA, you know, really, really fondly. It was great. So, and then of course, getting my dog was amazing and wonderful. And uh, when you first get your dog, you get it in the common room. And like the whole school, because it's so small, like the whole school is there just like, cause dog day is special for them too. They get to see all their hard work kind of come to fruition. And they were there, they see you get your dog. And it's just, everyone's so overjoyed and happy for you and with you and there's a lot of emotions going around and then you know you take your dog back to your room and they just give you an hour of just sitting there with your dog and 
you know, cuddling them, petting them, and getting to know them, and bonding with them, and it was really, really special. So, yeah, those were kind of the more memorable moments for me, and I loved them. <laughs> I loved, I loved going to the school, and I have nothing but fond memories about it. Yeah, sorry I chatted so much. This is a really fun topic for me, and I loved it. I hope you guys liked it too, and thank you so much, Joy, for putting up this tag. I think pretty much almost everyone that I know has done it, but I am going to tag forward with Forley because that guy and his cute little black lab do a lot of really great videos, and I think this would be one that they would love to do together. So, you guys have been tagged, ha ha ha. <laughs> Until next time, I have a lot of footage. I can't wait to show you guys a lot of upcoming videos, but uh, I was really happy I got to do this one. So, without further ado, thank you so much for watching, everyone, and I will be back soon with a new video. Goodbye!